right, let's talk about non-uniform circular motion. As you remember, uh, an object moving in uniform circular motion moves along a circular path, let's say with a radius r, and it does so with a speed that changes with time. So at some point, the object is going to have some acceleration a that points in some direction. And at that point, we could choose our coordinate axis to be t for tangential. So it's an axis that is tangential to the curve, to the trajectory at that point where the object is and the radial direction which is the direction which is an axis that points towards the center of the path, the center of the circle. If we choose our coordinate axis that way then the acceleration vector will have two components the tangential component and the radial component tangential along the t axis, radial along the r axis. The radial acceleration, uh, the component of the acceleration that we call radial is also what we, uh, we also call it the centripetal acceleration. The acceleration vector therefore can be written in terms of the radial component of the acceleration plus the vector tangential acceleration. The radial component of the acceleration is a vector with magnitude v squared divided by r that points in the direction of the unitary vector r. Notice that in this case we chose the direction r as pointing towards the center of the circle. Previously we talked about the vector r as pointing from the center of the circle to the position where the object is. And with that definition we obtained that the centripetal acceleration of an object moving in circular motion was minus v squared over r. So here we're changing the direction in which we define the coordinate axis r and with this new definition there is no minus in front of the equation. For the tangential component we have dv dt where v represents the speed of the object and the direction in which that goes is, is, in, the, is in the tangential direction which in this case for this motion it coincides with the direction of the velocity at all times. The net force acting on this object moving in such a way is a force that it's a vector that must be equal to the mass times the acceleration, the net acceleration, which means that the net force must be parallel to the acceleration vector in red. Since the acceleration vector has two components, the radial and the tangential, so will the net force acting on this object. Which tells us that the net force acting on an object moving with non-uniform circular motion must have a radial component that points towards the center of the path equal to mv squared over r and it must have a tangential component that is equal to m dv dt which points along the direction of the velocity. If dv dt is positive, if it is negative then it points in the opposite direction. So let's go back to a familiar example with a pendulum moving uh, being released at point 1, the pendulum swings all the way to point 5 where it momentarily stops and then of course it's going to swing back to 1 and so forth and so on. But let's look at the forces and accelerations present at these five different points along the path of the pendulum. Let's start with point 1 and choose the coordinate axis as said before to be the tangential coordinate axis, T, and the radial one pointing towards the center. The forces acting on the pendulum bob at this point are mg pointing downwards as usual and the tension on the string at point 1 which goes along the string. The string can only pull applying a force along the direction of the string. Now the weight of the object mg has components along the r axis and along the t axis. Now what's the component along the r axis? Well if we knew that angle between mg and the r axis then we could find that. Now what is that angle? Well if we specify that the initial location of the object was given by an angle theta1 from the vertical then that angle that we don't know is theta1 and the r component of the weight is mg cosine of theta 1. 
The other component, therefore, will be mg sine of theta1. This is the tangential component of the weight of the pendulum. So according to this, the tangential acceleration of the pendulum at point 1 should be equal to the tangential component of the force, the net force acting on the pendulum at point 1, divided by the mass. The tangential component of the net force acting on the pendulum, as you can see in the diagram, the only force with a, neck, with a T component is uh, mg, and its component along that axis is mg sine of theta 1. So the tangential acceleration at that point is going to be mg sine of theta 1 divided by the mass. The mass is cancelled, and we get g sine of theta 1. So the pendulum at that point has a tangential acceleration equal to g sine of theta 1. It is positive, which means the acceleration points in the same direction as the direction of the velocity. Now notice that this result should remind you of the result that we obtain for the motion of an object sliding down an incline, no friction, with an incline with an angle theta 1 with a horizontal. In this problem, we chose the x and the y axis, x along the plane, y perpendicular, and we figure out that the acceleration had an x component equal to g sine of theta, which is the result that we obtain here too for the pendulum. This is not so surprising because the forces acting on that object are very similar to the forces that we have for the pendulum. We had mg pointing straight down and we had the normal force pointing perpendicular to the incline which plays the role of the tension at point one which is perpendicular to the direction in which the pendulum is going to start moving which is uh, the tangential direction. Since those forces are uh, so similar, then the result, of course, is the same. The only difference between these two situations of the pendulum in general and the incline is that for the incline, the y acceleration was zero at all times. As we will see for the, for the pendulum, the radial acceleration is not always zero. Only at point one, the radial acceleration is actually zero because the velocity at that point is zero. Point 1 is the point when we release the pendulum. So at that point, the pendulum is released with velocity equal to 0. So the acceleration, radial acceleration, which is given by v squared divided by r, is going to be 0. The acceleration in the radial direction being 0 tells us that uh, from Newton's second law in the radial direction, t1 positive minus mg cosine of theta 1 because the component of mg in the radial direction is negative, so we have to put a minus sign. The sum of the forces should be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the radial direction. But that acceleration, as we said, is zero because v squared divided by r at that point is zero. So we get, therefore, that the tension is equal to mg cosine of theta 1. So just to write the equations, that we, the results that we have obtained so far, the first result is that the tangential acceleration is g sine of theta 1. Second result is that the radial acceleration is 0. And finally, for the tension, we obtain that the tension at point 1 is mg cosine of theta 1. Now let's do the same exercise at point 2. Let's analyze the forces and the accelerations of the pendulum at point 2. At point 2, the pendulum has an angle theta 2 from the vertical. The weight makes an angle theta 2 with the radial direction. Tension along the string. Velocity is not zero. The velocity at point 2, we know that is not zero. And it points in the direction that is uh, tangential to the curve. So this gives us that the radial acceleration at point 2 is not 0 and it's equal to v2 squared divided by r. The tangential acceleration at point 2 is going to be given by the tangential, the component of the net force acting on the pendulum. The net force acting on the pendulum has a tangential component given by mg sine of theta 2, as we obtained before. So the tangential acceleration is going to be g sine of theta 2. 
the tension in the string at point 2, you might think that it is going to be equal to mg cosine of theta 2. From your free body diagram, you might think that those two tensions, that those two components should cancel each other. But that would be wrong. Because we have an acceleration in the radial direction now. Remember that Newton's second law says that the sum of the forces, in this case in the radial direction, should be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the radial direction. The acceleration in the radial direction is not zero because the velocity at point two is not zero. So tension two minus mg cosine of theta two should be equal to m a radial at point two. So the tension can be written as mg cosine of theta two plus m v2 squared divided by r. So the tension is going to be bigger than the component of the weight in the radial direction. Why? Because the object is moving in a circle, which means that it has a centripetal acceleration, which means that there must be a radial component of the net force to provide for the acceleration of the object in that direction. If the net force in the radial direction was zero, the object would not move in a circle, it will move in a straight line. The next point that we can take a quick look at the forces and acceleration oh. is at point 3. At point 3, notice that the tension and the weight are pointing in the same direction. We do have a velocity that is not equal to zero. In fact, it's the maximum velocity of the pendulum in, in its trajectory. The tangential component of the acceleration, we have derived it before, it's going to be g sine of the angle between the pendulum string and the vertical, but that angle at point 3 is clearly 0. So the tangential component at point 3 is 0. The tension at point 3 is given by the equation that we derived before, replacing of course 3 instead of 2. Notice that the angle theta 3 is 0, therefore the cosine is 1 so we can get rid of that. The velocity is the velocity at point 3. Notice that the tension at point 3 is going to be a maximum. It's going to have the maximum value because the velocity of the pendulum at point 3 is also the maximum value. It's bigger than the velocity at 1, 2, 4, or 5, or any other point. This is also true because the radial component of the weight, mg cosine theta, has also a maximum value when theta is equal to zero. So the string is under the greatest tension when the pendulum is at position three. At point four, we can do uh, the same thing that we've done before. We uh, write the we do the free body diagram with the t axis and the r axis are indicated, and Everything proceeds as before, except that I want to show you this point in particular because you have to be careful about the sign of the tangential acceleration. The angle at that point is theta 4 measured from the vertical. The tangential acceleration, it's going to have a negative sign. Notice that the component of the weight along the tangential axis is negative because the positive tangential direction is to the right. Since the tangential component of the weight is pointing to the left, you have to put a minus sign in your equation. The tangential acceleration at point 4 is minus g sine of theta 4. Centripetal acceleration, as before, would be the velocity at that point squared divided by r, and the, uh, and the tension on the string will be mg cosine of theta 4 plus mv4 squared divided by r, just as before. Once again, notice that the minus sign, and it tells you that the tangential component of the acceleration is opposite to the velocity at point 4. Since the pendulum at point 4 is on its way up, it's going uphill, then the tangential acceleration vector points downhill in the opposite direction, which means that the pendulum is actually slowing down. Whenever the acceleration points in a direction opposite to the direction of the velocity, you can be sure that the object is slowing down. At point 5, the tangential acceleration it's going to point also in that direction. It's going to be bigger according to the fact that theta 5 is bigger than theta 4, 
the acceleration, tangential acceleration at the, at all the other points, 1 and 2, uh, we know that it goes in the direction of the velocity. At point 1 should be bigger than at point 2, given the fact that the angle theta 1 is bigger than the angle theta 2. And we figure out that the tangential acceleration at point 3 was 0. So this completes the uh, analysis for the non-uniform circular motion of a pendulum. We have looked at the forces acting on the pendulum, the tangential component of these forces, the radial component of the forces, and we've calculated the tangential and the centripetal acceleration of the pendulum at different points. The only thing missing to complete the full analysis of the pro this problem is to, to have an equation for the velocity of the pendulum as a function of theta. We will derive this equation after we have talked about conservation of energy.